Well, now on BBC One, the third programme in the series to help you play better badminton. show you how to make the moves from the rear court and for this we use the stroke, the drop, the clear and the smash. One thing about these shots, if the shuttle is high in the mid court we can still use the smash to the opponent's mid court and also the drop to his fore court. So it's not only in the rear court we use those two strokes. What we're going to look at this week are the replies to the rear court moves and the first reply we'll consider are the replies to the smash. If you look at the reply to the smash now, Paul Wetmel, the far end, is smashed up by Ray Stevens. The two basic replies here, the clear to the rear court and the block to the fore court. Block to the fore court, clear to the rear court. Now I've shown you the two basic replies to the smash, first with the block and second with the lift. What we'll do now is have a look at the block. The player takes up a defensive stance, feet apart, racket held in front, very alert position, weight on the balls of the feet. What he's trying to do here is block the shuttle and get it over the net below net level just before the smasher comes in to hit down for the winner. If he does this, he forces the smasher to lift the shuttle and so gains the attack for himself. Well, let's see how we do this. Start with the racket so. We can take the racket back and defend on the backhand side, the shuttle near the ground, block it over the net and return to the ready position. On the right side, you can block on the forehand, send the shuttle over the net and return to the ready position. And sometimes the smash comes a little bit higher. So from this central position we can turn and block the shuttle high and return, or block it on the forehand side high and return. The main thing is alertness of stance and the racket always ready to make this block. Okay, let's go back on court now and see the players do this. Get set. Nice block. Just over the net into the fore court. Ready? Steers the shuttle from the backhand side into the fore court. Notice the rack held in front of the body. That's a higher block. Like a head up. Now it becomes quite obvious. If you only made the block reply to the smash, the opponent would soon catch on and come storming into the net after the smash and hit down for a winner most times. So we have to use a second reply. And this is a flip clear to the rear court. Let's see how this is done. We take the defensive stance, racket held in front. We prepare as we do for the block by taking the racket back. Instead of blocking now, we whip the racket head underneath the shuttle upwards at speed to send it to the rear court and return to the ready position to defend again. So again, prepare, take the racket back with the hand Flick underneath at speed and send the shuttle along the way to the rear court and return to the defensive stance. On the forehand side, prepare, take the racket head back, whip it under the shuttle, up in front of the body and ready to defend against the smash again. Now when you do flick clear, make sure you hit the shuttle up high over the opponent's head, deep towards the rear court, along this sort of trajectory. Right, we'll try this defensive moves to the power of Ray Stevens smash. See what it's like on the receiving end here. <coughs> Ready for the shift? <coughs> now we get the block. And the block. Notice how you set yourself to get the block. And you don't make the mistake, and don't allow him to hit down the winner. Turn to the forehand, right? <coughs> Ready again. Ah, the winner. Well, as you can see, it's an energetic business playing defence. But it's important that you work hard at it. 
because you've got to keep this opponent at bay and try to turn defence into attack. And if I can get the shuttle below the level of the net before he comes in, then he get, I get him to lift to me. If he comes rushing in, I can flick it over his head, then I might catch him out with the weak return and get the attack myself. What we've done is play the two replies to the smash. The lift to the rear court, which we don't have to worry about because we know the replies from there, the drop, the clear and the smash. And also the block to the forecourt. Now this gives us new problems. Because when the shuttle is blocked to the forecourt, the smasher can come in and meet it, sometimes just above net level, sometimes just below, and sometimes it's a little bit slow near the ground in the forecourt. And each new situation there requires a new stroke to play the shot. The shot we'll take first is when the shuttle is just above the level of the net. And the main thing here is that we must attack it and go in for the kill. So we stand in a defensive position to practice it, racket ready, and now we step forward, lunge in, hit down, and recover. And the recovery is important, because anybody can go in and hit the shuttle in the net, but you've got to get back to cover the opponent's possible reply. Again, so ready, lunge, and recover. Now if you want to be a little bit more dynamic and make it more exciting, you can do a jump lunge. So there you are ready, and you jump in, kill, land, and recover quickly for the next shot. Once again, jump land and recover for the next shot. Right, let's see the players doing this in a rally situation. Karen to serve and Nora to demonstrate the lunge and the neck kill. Kills and recovers ready for the reply. Good kill and alert ready for the next reply. The net lunge and kill are most effective when receiving the low serve. We'll show you this now. Kill and recover ready for the reply. Racket stays up, ready to threaten. Alert, stand set. Now let's look at the receiving stance. Alert, kill and recover once again. Ready to spin forward. Very explosive movement here from the stance. Now you're not always going to be that lucky in a game that you find yourself in the forecourt with the shuttle above the level of the net when you can go on and kill it. As I've said previously, sometimes the shuttle is below net level and very often that's quite near to the ground. And the most attacking move in this situation is to make a return into the forecourt. And to do this the shuttle must be hit upwards and yet pass very close to the net otherwise it allows the opponent to hit down. If you want to make it pass close to the net, you must do it with a trajectory which looks something like this. Right, let's show you how to play this stroke. Most important thing is balance and control. So we take the defensive position, one foot in front of the other, racket held in front of the body ready to threaten. Now we've got to assume the shuttle is below net level, so we must push it up. So that means we've got to take the racket below the shuttle to hit upwards. Forearm is horizontal approximately. Nice, comfortable, balanced position. And then we can lower ourselves to the ground if it's very low, in balance. Lunge there, and recover again. Backhand side, the same thing, and recover again. Let's see how this is done with the top. Gently pushing up. Lower the ground, lower the trunk. Always in balance. Move around. It goes away, we can go towards. Just like softly on the feet like a fencer. Backhand grip and backhand face of the racket. Go down. Very gentle touch. And pushing it with the racket head face. Very flat face, very gentle. Absolute control. Okay. That's a simple practice which you can do quite well at home. And done regularly will improve your forecourt play enormously. A very gentle touch. Trying to get the shuttle close to the net. If it goes too high, it's easy to hit down. In balance as we play the stroke, pushing up. Well, that was one reply from the forecourt. Now we'll show you another one. This time, when the shuttle is near the top of the net, but just below net level. And the idea here is to make a reply and send it just over the net, back into the forecourt, in such a way that the opponent finds it difficult to return it accurately and with control. And we're able to do this because the shuttle will rotate in the air and present an awkward spin. <clears throat> if
if I hit the shuttle a glancing blow with the side edge of the racket that way, I can make it rotate in the air. If I hit it that way, I can rotate the other direction. And if I hit it or jump with the top edge of the racket, I can make, make it rotate towards me. This has the effect of making the shuttle tumble in the air. We call it a tumbler simply because the base being heavier than the head, it goes up slowly and then falls quickly, just like the clothes in the tumble dryer. So now we'll go back on court and see our two men, Ray and Paul, play a rally of tumblers and then mix these together with the other replies from the forecourt. We'll start with Paul demonstrating how to play the forehand tumbler and the backhand tumbler and then we'll continue using them in the rally situation. Rapid position, glancing blow. Very gentle one, makes the shuttle rotate. Back inside, rapid position, it's a glancing blow. Very simple practice, you can do at home. And the players try and stay in balance, fences position. Lots of concentration required here and control. That one that went near the ground, Paul tried to push it up. Idea is to try and take it near the top of the net when possible. Good one. As you can see, it takes a lot of practice, even for top players like this, to keep the rally going without making an error. For all net shots require great delicacy of touch, something that's not easy to achieve particularly with the plastic shuttlecocks that's all most players can afford to buy these days. Feather shuttlecocks like this cost almost a pound each, which is quite expensive. So what makes them so expensive? Bernard Adams went to find out. All the feathered shuttles made in Britain come from Sandwich in Kent. Ian McConaughey, manager of the factory for the last 30 years, explains why they cost so much. One of the greatest troubles that we've had recently is that when I first started this business, you could buy the finest goose feathers for about four and sixpence old money per pound. Now, when I tell you today that not only are they very scarce, but the ruling price is anywhere between five pounds fifty to nine pounds per pound weight. So you will see that the feather shuttle is a bound to be a fairly expensive proposition. The first step in making a shuttlecock is to wash the feathers. A non-detergent soap is used so that they will retain the grease which gives them their lasting power. The best come from Europe, but they're scarce, and nowadays most come from the Far East and from China in particular. Next, the feathers spend an hour in the drying room. From the drying room, they go off to be sorted individually by hand. Each shuttle is made of feathers from one side of the goose, from either the right or the left side of the bird. As she works, the sorter keeps the right side feathers in her right hand and the left side feathers in her left hand. Substandard feathers are rejected. Next, the selected feathers are punched out into their final shape. Now the feathers are ready to be joined to the cork base of the shuttle. The bases are made from raw cork bottle stoppers which are precision shaped to a tolerance of one ten thousandth of an inch. Next, the bases are covered with leather and then trimmed by a process which the manufacturers who keep a keen eye on their Far Eastern competitors like to keep secret. After each base has had 16 holes drilled in it, it's ready to receive the feathers.
Cork is such a resilient and elastic material that no glue is necessary to keep the feathers in the holes. In the early days of badminton, the feathers on the shuttlecock were not stitched together, but nowadays two rows of machine stitching are put round each shuttle. But the final process of tidying up the stitching is done by hand. Precise and careful manufacture and good raw materials are needed for the shuttles to fly consistently. This makes them costly, but can the cheaper plastic shuttle ever be as good? Does the future of badminton lie with plastic or feathered shuttles? Oh, both, both. Uh, I think the synthetic shuttle will increase because I see no prospects of the supply of suitable goose feathers increasing. In fact, I would hazard a guess and say that the supply is more likely to decrease rather than increase. We've now shown you all the basic moves required to play singles or doubles. Although so far, we've concentrated solely on singles because it's a much clearer way of showing the basic principles. So by now, you should be able to analyze the moves made in a game and work out how one or other player wins it. Here we have Ray and Paul in the middle of a game. And let's see how they use the moves against each other. Rear court, rear court, rear court. A good drop to the forecourt. I serve the rear foot from Ray. Rear foot from Paul. And he lunges in to make the downward hit. Forcing mistake from Ray. Things to look for here is how quickly they move to the shuttle. After making a, a move, return quickly to get in position for the reply. That was a weak lift that Ray obtained with a good turn to the forecourt. And the high serve which sends Paul to the rear court. Even though the players are playing clear, they're making attacking moves and moving each other away from the space in the centre, creating space to make the downward hit. It takes a lot of concentration. One week return, and the other player can attack it. Four court, rear court, four court. Next week we'll be showing you how to play men's and ladies doubles. But now, just before we finish our three programmes on singles play, I'd like to ask our two world-class single stars, Nora and Ray, a few questions about how they first started to play the game. And Nora, you've been playing quite a long time now. How did you first start to play? Well, I first started at school, and I must be honest, I put more emphasis on actually going on the court and hitting shuttles in preference to going out training. And I think the main thing is, you've still got to go out and enjoy the games, whether you win or lose. I think at, at the very young age, that's very important. So when did the training come in then? When I was winning some junior titles, I decided that you just can't go out and play singles. You've got to go out and do some physical training as well. And Ray, how about you then? Well, badminton was a very popular game in our school. And uh, we used to play it morning, noon and night. Uh, in fact, getting there at about 6.30 in the morning. Who let you in at that time? Or? Well, we were the caretaker's curse at that time. Well, they opened up for you? Yes, that's right. So, really, my game was uh, founded, especially at an early age, on uh, lots and lots of practice. Thanks, Nora and Ray. Well, they confirm that badminton singles at any level requires a great deal of fitness, and at the top level, superb fitness. Working towards this end, there's a young man of 20 who has made a name for himself as a singles player. So he went along to a park in Essex to see him start a day's training. Kevin Jolly is one of Britain's brightest young men's singles prospects. He trains or practices every day, beginning with a run in Hainault Forest in Essex. I find that when I'm running, 
the whole world just is in a relaxed state and I'm just thinking about playing badminton, moving, all the, the good times and the bad times in the sport. It just gives me a time to, to think about things clearly and get them organised in my mind. It's also just a nice way to start the day running a breakfast when the dew's on the grass and the sunshine coming up. After breakfast, Kevin goes along to the nearby Redbridge Sports Centre where he practices with Ray Stevens and other top players as well as going through a strenuous routine of exercises. What a badminton player needs is strong legs and quite a light upper part of the body to get him around the court as quickly as possible. The badminton player has to be extremely supple, so that, that includes a lot of stretching exercises um, and strengthening exercises. Badminton is a very physically demanding sport. I know that if I go to a tournament at the weekend and I haven't put in the, the physical training, push myself to, to the maximum, during the week, then not only will I suffer physically at the weekend, I will suffer mentally as well. I have to feel that I've done the training, worked myself to the maximum to have confidence for a championship play. We asked Kevin what qualities a successful singles player needs. Certainly discipline, and also attitude of mind, coolness, on court, um, play the crucial points in a cool manner, uh, and also the skill, of course, which without that you, you'll never make it. There's no doubt about Kevin's skill and style as a player, though sometimes in the past his record has not reflected his potential, but now he's prepared to work even harder to get the results he wants. What's your ultimate ambition? Ultimate ambition, it is and always has been, uh, to eventually to win the All England Men's Singles Championships, which is the unofficial World Championship similar to Wimbledon in tennis. Do you think you'll do it? You've always got to have hope. But I've been told by many, many people that I've got the ability of a World Champion, that that is the skills, the, the physical tributes to the game. All it is is a matter of the temperament. If I can get the temperament perfect, then I think I'm in a fair chance and, and everybody else is human in the world. They're all beatable. This was a game that Kevin lost, perhaps partly because of his temperament. But he's worked on his mental attitude, and he has to his credit some good wins, including one over the world champion Fleming Delfs, when England played Denmark. Rally. Kevin, now that you earn your living full-time from playing badminton, has it taken any of the enjoyment out of the game for you? Um, I felt that in the last uh, few months or so, thinking about badminton going open, it's put a little bit more pressure on me and many of the players because you know that everybody else is going to be working a lot, lot harder than they've ever worked before. That means you've got to step it up a little bit. You're not on your own anymore. Everybody can see money in front of them, incentives. Um, but I feel that, I know that if I'm going to play well, I've got to enjoy the game still. If I don't enjoy it, that means I won't play well and I won't earn the money. Uh, so you've got to try and get yourself a nice balance, which is what I'm hoping to do. You must enjoy it, otherwise there's no chance. <laughs> book to accompany the series entitled The Badminton Story, which gives the illustrated history of badminton from Victorian times to the modern world game, is on sale at bookshops, price £6.75 in hardback and £4.15 in paperback.